my name is Robert Horton and I'm the Vertical Farm Technician here at Wigan University Technical College. Vertical farming is rather than continue to expand our farms outwards, to expand them upwards. So rather than build a 10 acre greenhouse and have 10 acres physically taken up, why not build an acre greenhouse and do 10 layers on top of it? Due to the increase in population, which is going to hit 9 billion by 2050, we're going to rely heavily on future technologies and that's where hydroponics plays a massive part. This specific vertical farm can grow plants that you would normally grow on an acre and a half in the space of the room behind us. At first we sow them and then they're placed in the propagation room and after a few weeks um, they are placed on the hydroponic unit in the, in the troughs and after that, once they are fully grown, they are harvested. We grow a wide variety of things. We focus mainly on herbs because that's what we use downstairs in the production kitchen. However, we have grown lettuce, we've grown chilies, we've grown peppers. Um, we grow a lot of Chinese herbs for a local Chinese restaurant, so we grow the pak choy, the choy sum and the kai lin. We grow in a hydroponic conveyor belt. It does one revolution every half hour. Um, we use that system to water the plants so that each plant can get the same amount of water but also we use it so they can share the sunlight and get the same amount of sunlight. So the plants are grown in a synthetic soil um, and it's done this way so that you can monitor how much water's going through it and how much water the plant's absorbing and the growing rate. It basically recycles the water that it uses so the plants take in the amount of water that they need but then the remainder water which would normally be uh, drained into the earth it's collected and pumped around the system back into the plants again. It's 90% less water than what you'd use in a natural field. Well, I originally come from a farming family and we're very limited by the seasons, so we have to sow everything in the spring and then harvest it throughout the year. Here, we can be sowing all year round, harvesting all year round. If you're a farmer, you can have a bad day, you can have a good day, it just depends on what the weather wants but you can control that with a vertical farm. And grow vertically, we can grow on rooftops, we can grow in a building such as this, where traditionally you would need acres and acres of fields to do such a thing. Hydroponics is still evolving as to how we're using it. In, say, Japan, for example, where there's a lot of people in a small space, they have started turning all the old technology factories where they used to make floppy drives and CD drives, which are now obsolete, and they've started creating plant factories where they'll literally just grow nothing but one crop, so say they'll grow nothing but lettuce or nothing but pak choy. This is giving them lots of fresh, healthy vegetables. Since the growing population, in, especially in the, in the coming future, I definitely think that the, um, the vertical farm hydroponics will definitely be used more, more and more around the world. Food security is something that's becoming very important very quickly. We're an expanding population in England. There's more and more people and we're building houses all the time, which means there's less farmland. We either have to ship it in from abroad, which means your food is a week, two weeks old by the time it gets to you, or you can grow it here in a vertical farm. We can harvest food here and be using it, cooking it, have it delivered in an hour. Uh, our next speaker is uh, someone I met some time back. Um, again, you know, all my friends are, have dirty fingernails these days. Um, Thorben, and um, he's here to talk about uh, Arrow Springs. Again, you know, entrepreneur coming up with an idea, loves planting, and then he's created this whole uh, uh, system that you can see outside. And, you know, he took a bet, and it's doing very well now. and selling very well. So let me welcome Thorben. Oh. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Torben, I'm Danish. Anyway, I'm from Denmark. Uh, my parents were entrepreneurs, I, would, I, th I think I would say. They, uh, in the 70s, they had a clothing factory uh, in Denmark and they produced fashion clothes for, for young girls. Uh, and I think from that, I learned a lot about the hardships of 
having your own business. They went bankrupt twice, and uh, they had years where they were doing really well. Uh, so I think I've seen you know, the, the ups and the downs of, of being in a startup. And I think part of my message today is not so much only about growing your own food, which is certainly my message. Just let me know when I'm ready. I'm ready now. So uh, yes, we grow our own food. This is how I started the business. We wanted to, to, to get out of this cycle of, of uh, buying very expensive, tasteless tomatoes from America uh, that were washed in hydrogen peroxide. Anyway, so predicting the future is really difficult. You know, it's no different than the weather. Uh, it changes all the time, and especially in Singapore. So what I think I've learned is that, that you get a new perspective, and you have to go with the punches and roll with them. And I think the path that I have had to, to become a founder of, of an urban growth technology company uh, is one of diversity as well. Um, so I've already gone through this a little bit. I'm from a very small town called Ikast in Denmark. I've been here for 18 years. I'm a PR since 2009. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've done IT. Uh, electronic waste recycling, uh, and I love uh, DIY projects. So I like to build my own stuff. Uh, I think that's something that's missing in the Singapore culture. You don't have a Bauhaus or a Bunnings. Why not? Because none of you fixes your own toilets. None of you changes the tap if it's broken or leaking. But in Denmark, where we pay 60% tax, we all do that because we have no choice. Um, so why did we start growing our own food? It was really because of the quality of the food and the price of the food that we were well, faced with. The, the, honestly, the tomatoes that there was actually like this one moment when we went to the supermarket and we had guests over and I bought some of these tomatoes and I got the cheaper ones because they're damn expensive. So we came home and we had the dinner and I swear to God, if you closed your eyes and ate the tomato, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to hold your, your nose because there was just no flavor to it. There's no flavor at all. And then we went to got the more expensive tomatoes, and then you're looking at two or three dollars for a tomato, and it just eventually pissed us off to a degree where we said, okay, let's try and grow our own tomatoes. So this picture is quite old, and it's quite dark on this uh, screen here, but actually this <laughs> tomato plant is the reason we started. That's how I started it, and that plant died uh, soon after this picture was taken because we went on a four-day we four uh, long weekend to Malaysia. Um, what's next to it is uh, the first prototypes of the Aerospring, which was that I realized because of the, the way that um, we were living and, and growing in soil was so difficult for us uh, because of, you know, when you leave it alone, you don't water it, it gets a very hot day, uh, we had bogs in them. Um, so I decided to build a system that was independent of soil that would be able to grow a lot of food on a very small space. Um, and we... Um, and, and something, most importantly, that was self-watering, so that we didn't have to keep remembering to, to, to water it. Um, so what happened was that I went out and I got some PVC pipe. These are six-inch PVC pipes. They're two meters long, and they cost about $20 for a pipe. And I saw a video on YouTube, and I, I decided, OK, let's, let's try to, uh, to make a, a vertical garden. So I, I got a heat gun and a saw. And I actually, these, these holes are melted uh, by, by heating up the PVC pipe a couple of minutes and then putting in a, a, a wood template or a wood peg that I had, you know, sanded down uh, that was approximately of the shape of the white cups that are in the system. And uh, <clears throat> basically, uh, th this, this picture, sorry, let me just go back. This picture here is from uh, Richwood, which is not far uh, out in the west a little bit, and uh, it's a friend's place, and uh, we set them up there. I, I, I built 10 of them, and we started to, to grow a 60 liter bucket. There's an aquarium pump in it that just lifts the water up to the top. Um, and we cultivated over uh, 300 plants for about two years, and we made you know, a lot of mistakes. Sometimes we would have really hot days, and we realized, oh, you know, uh, these plants couldn't handle that. Um, we as we, we started to grow, and you can actually see in the picture one of the, the poles in the back there, they're a bit droopy, it was a hot day. Uh, we, later in the year, you'll see this is about six months of growth from Basel. Um, and what I soon realized was that we started, when we went to dinner parties with friends, normally I'll bring a bottle of wine, but soon we started to bring Ziploc bags full of basil, mint, uh, coriander, whatever herbs and tomatoes that we were able to grow. 
And actually, this, it started as a hobby, not at all as a business idea. And we were just so thrilled that we were able to grow all of this type of uh, herbs and lettuce. And it actually sort of opened our eyes to the reality that it is not that difficult. If you build a system that's self-sustaining, that waters itself, that you actually can forget about for a while and the plants deal with it themselves, it makes a lot of sense. This is our balcony at Pandan Valley. We had 15 kilos of uh, cucumbers coming off of that. It took probably four months to get the plant that big and then kapoom, we got, I don't know, 75 you know, cucumbers or more. And we had uh, gin tonic with cucumbers every night. These are our jalapenos. <laughs> and um, all types of chilies that I actually didn't even know that was possible to grow in this country. Um, so what happened was that our friends, they kept saying, oh my god, this is amazing. Uh, can, you, can you make me one of your poles? And um, it takes about six or seven hours to make one of these poles. And, and uh, you chip a lot of nails, and you burn your fingers. So I decided at one point, uh, after probably 50 of our friends said, you know, I want to do this too. Can, can you make me one, or can you show me how to do it? So we decided to, uh, to, um, to set it up. And, and just as a, another reason why we, I jumped into this was that uh, I spent the last previous 12 months raising funds for a uh, fuel saving technology firm uh, that were able to save a lot of fuel in diesel engines. At the time, fuel was hovering, uh, diesel fuel was hovering about $100 uh, a barrel. And uh, now, what is it, six, $17 or something? Um, Anyway, that whole deal went bust mainly because of investors and VCs and uh, law, law firms not keeping their end of the deals. And I think also I got a little bit tired with that and burned out from that because I put a lot of effort into it. And that, I think, even spurred me more into the direction of, of doing the planting thing because whenever I came home from the office, I simply went into the garden and I forgot about all this bullshit that was going on in my day life. And I became you know, an urban gardener and it really relaxed me and I felt so happy doing that. And um, so PVC pipes, we understood when I wanted to do the business was that I did some research. PVC pipe is being used by a lot of farms for, to grow in. It's actually not the best plastic. If you leave it out in the sun for a couple of years, it starts to crack. And when it starts to crack, you start having leaching of certain bad chemicals that comes into the water. And God knows what happens. Does it come into our salad? Uh, so, I understood that I had to build a system that was both durable and able to stay in the sun for, for, uh, for many years without degrading. Um, and secondly, a system that could be packed into a box and shipped anywhere in the world. So future-proof um, is really t talking about you know, future me. And, and I think that this business and, and growing your own food and having an industry or business around it is future-proof. <laughs> You know, we want to, in, to educate, innovate, and inspire the next generation about healthier food, healthier living, and about the benefits of... It's not just the fact that you can have a salad that you grew yourself. That's so cool, but it's not only about that. It's also about the fact that the salad that I used to buy at cold storage or fair price comes from the United States of America. I mean, think about that. It's from the other side of the planet, the salad. It's a simple plant, really, and we ship it in, we put it in a plane, we ship it around the world to Singapore and then to cold storage. It'll probably have 50% waste before it actually gets to the shelf where you can choose it. So by the time that you get it, maybe it's four weeks old. It's been washed in hydrogen peroxide. There's no oxygen in the container when you open it because that would make it rot a lot quicker. So there's no nutrients in that food, not, none at all. Um, so I believe that it's very important that we, we, we start considering, and, and the product that we have developed is able to get you all to grow your own food if you have 50 centimeters of floor space on your balcony with adequate light. You know, you use neglected or outdoor space that you're not using. How many of you have a barbecue that's got a cover on that's only being used about twice a year, right? That's the type of space I'm talking about. What about the other side of the balcony where you have four pot plants with dead soil and twigs sticking out? We all have that, right? Because they don't survive in, 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 in the pots. So I, when I decided to do the business, I, I, because I'm Danish, and, I, and, and when I was a kid, I always wanted to get these speakers. These are Bang & Olufsen speakers. And they're from 1986. But they were the shit in it back then. They were you know, five $6,000. It's like price of a car, really. 
and I just really loved them. And one of my rich friends, I saw them in his house once, and I never forgot the sound as well. So part of me got inspired by the Bang & Olufsen speakers. It's a pentagon. And the second part was obviously that you know Lego is Danish. And uh, I grew up with Lego. And I was the kind of kid that would take a Lego set that was supposed to be a ship, but I'll build a truck. I never looked at the manual anyway. I just you know did stuff like that. So this is sort of like how I, I thought about it. My further inspiration also came from, the, like, I really like the idea of the hexagon, the honeycomb. First of all, it's very strong. And the way that you can sort of space them out if you have a, a commercial farm with aerospring gardens is very cool uh, and very useful in the in use of the space. Obviously, Lego as well. Um, so this is, uh, what I'm taking you through is really like the story of getting the idea and up until launch. So this is the first uh, 3D printed prototype. Now that part cost me $500, but it was very, very cool. And I'll show you, uh, I, I, I then get, got, after I bought that $500 part and I realized I had to make changes to it, uh, I realized that I can't afford buying $500 parts all the time. So I got myself a 3D printer. I taught myself how to 3D print. It's actually not hard if any of you want to try uh, jump right into it. It's a lot of fun, and it's not that hard anymore. Um, so I was 3D printing all of these different models, trying to achieve um, a column where, where that I was satisfied with, as in I didn't want it to drip water on your floor if you put it inside. I wanted it to look good. I wanted the plants to have enough space for the roots to grow. And all of that really, how do you know if a plant needs how much root space and stuff? So you have to try. So I grew a lot. I printed about two and a half kilometers of plastic. Uh, and here is, uh, you can turn the volume down of the video if, if possible. Um, so this is just to show you how we 3D printed. It took 24 hours to print one of these sections. And um, I then took it from the printer into my garden. And you know, every day I added another section until I had like 12 or 15 sections and I was growing on our balcony in these shapes. Um, let me see if I can go forward. So basically after maybe six or seven months of research and development and printing different design solutions, I came up with this final design and I came up with, uh, yeah, there's actually seven, seven individual plastic parts that makes up the the, the product. So there are seven injection molding tools that we wanted to go for. Um, so I took control of my own future, decided to let go of all of these VC world and you know high fees and uh, very little integrity, <laughs> and uh, took control, set up our own business, and it was a leap of faith because honestly. I didn't know if anyone except myself really thought this was cool. All my friends, sure, but I don't think they always tell us the truth when we start a business. Uh, they sometimes you know, say, oh yeah, it's cool, but in reality, they don't really like it that much. So we invested everything we had into this, uh, and the only thing that I did very wisely was that you know, all the things that you're not good at in the startup, make sure that you find people that are better at it. So once I had done my design and my 3D printing, I got a... Uh, uh, design for production agency. They do a lot more than that, and I want to mention their name. They're called Amphibian. They are uh, registered in Singapore, and they have a team of engineers, product designers, uh, mechanical engineers, and sourcing people, manufacturing people all around the world. It's a very small company, but what they were able to do was to basically give me a professional organization of five or six people that I could use. I pay a monthly fee to use them, and they were then able to take my crazy idea, my design, and make it into a producible, um, mass producible part. And that's how I was able to get to the tooling. Because it becomes quite technical for, for us normal people to, to do those things. Um, here is uh, our home. And this is the prototypes. And that big green in the background is the, is the cucumber plant that I talked to you about before. And you, as you can see, we have plenty of, of herbs and vegetables for our own garden. We have mint, chives, thyme, you know, parsleys, uh, chilies, pretty much anything that we wanted to grow, we are able to grow in the system. That's, um, so it's been a, a fantastic journey. And I just wanted to show you this because, look, I, I'm not a gardener. I am not a mechanical engineer. 
I'm not really anything except for tenacious, maybe. And uh, I just got pissed off with the t prices of the tomatoes. And I'm really happy that I got these shitty tomatoes today because I was able to then actually get provoked almost to take action. And this is really, I think, one of the important messages for young entrepreneurs in Singapore is that there's so many naysayers out there, so many people that tell you you can't do it, that it's too difficult, and you should go and work for a bank. You know, um, but it's very possible. So this is the second prototype. I went through different iterations of the system. Um, so as you can see on the, on the left side is the very sharp-edged, uh, one of the earlier prototypes. And on the right is actually the later one. And I was actually able to see that the plants were doing better in the later designs, because it has to do with how the roots spread out when they come inside of the, the interior of the system, how much space they have to grow. Uh, and I was actually able to, to test this with the 3D printer. So I could get an idea on Monday, and on, on Tuesday I could try it out. That's really incredible. So as you can see, our mints, everything started to grow better and better. And we got better and better at uh, growing. This is how we, this is us going for a dinner party, basically, bringing herbs straight from the garden. I tell you one thing is that all of the herbs and vegetables that you are all eating today, they don't really taste like that. If you grow them yourself, you will realize they have a different flavor. Uh, that's almost getting lost. So. After all of this mumbo jumbo and, and, and trying and trials, it was time to then basically pull, pull the trigger. And um, in this business, it, that means making the injection molding tools. And they are huge. They are, uh, you see the, on the left there, that is the, the, the cavity of the bucket. So that piece on the left probably weighs about two tons. And the other piece that fits into the top is about two tons as well. So we did all of this. Most of the, the parts are produced in Singapore. The bucket and the bucket lid were made in China. Um, but all of these parts here are produced in Singapore. Fantastic little company called Yinshan Engineering in Tuapaya North. Um, I do pay a little bit more you know, to produce it in Singapore, but I'm proud to do that. And it, also financially and business-wise, I think it makes sense to have your produ production partner close to you. Um, we have developed a wonderful relationship, and they're giving me payment terms I didn't even ask for today. That would never happen in China. Nobody is going to copy it uh, before I, you know, uh, if I had produced it in China, I'm so worried that my design, which I've patented both the design and the function of, will be copied even before I get to launch it. I've seen that happen many times. So all of the different parts, you can see the steel molds for that. And um, this is into a pile, and uh, this is the wife of Fiona, <laughs> uh, out on the production line. Uh, the cycle time to make one of the parts is about 60 seconds. So for you, all of you who don't know anything about injection molding, you have a steel mold that comes together. And after 60 seconds, you, you inject the hot plastic, molten plastic. And then after about 60 seconds, out comes a fully completed part that used to take me about 26 hours to print. So can make them very quickly. So we launched in February 2016. Uh, we had a lot of pre-orders, maybe 80 pre-orders. And I decided, uh, we decided that the way to deliver this product to the, to the people is not to give them a box and send them on their way. It would be to go to their house, figure out where to install it, um, talk to the owners and the, uh, of the garden, and give them the, the plants already growing. So we set out to actually grow I don't know, five, 6,000 seedlings in our living room uh, on, a, on, a, on a rack with LED lights. Uh, and we had uh, some people helping us. And I went, went out and I have installed maybe 90 systems myself. I drove in February about 2,600 kilometers in a van and did all these installations. So these are pictures I have taken. And we are starting to, from Nassim Rope, Sunset Way. I mean, we have been at, at HDB flats with no uh, balconies. And I have been at very, very expensive places too. So it seems that there is a general appeal of this product. So you can see there's a before and after. This is out in Tulakura. We actually, Tulakura, I think I have five customers. I don't know why, but something is going on out there. But I'm very happy about it. This is another one. This is at the Cube, I think, uh, on Thompson Road. This is a six week. We just got that picture in, I think, two days ago. So that really warms my heart to see that 
with doing nothing except you know after I installed it, just leaving it alone, they start having that much success with it. Um, so I have many of these examples. Kids love it. Uh, in fact, I have uh, maybe four or five customers where the, when I come and install it, the parents, they say, no, this is not ours. This is uh, my son's or my daughter's. And they are the ones who, who, who listen. They are the ones who understand how to maintain it. So it's really a, a great thing to, to for, for children. And uh, also some larger children. Um, this is a Cafe Melba out at the Goodman Arts Center. We, this is our first professional customer because one of our aims is to not only to enable private people to be able to grow their own food, but why not help some restaurants that have outdoor space get some fresh herbs and vegetables that they can take straight from the, the, the pole and straight into basically your dishes. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that's basically what we are, where we are now. I think we have sold about 200 gardens that was my first production run. We are producing again next week. Uh, so you can order <laughs> if you want. Um, we are listed at uh, Tangs, we had Fais Flora, and the Bureau, which is at Tanbun Liat building. Um, we have some, you know, b b beyond Cafe Melba, we are going into another restaurant on the Orchard Road at the, the Hirin, which is uh, Angela May Food Chapters, opening in April. Um, and we are talking to NMCs about their corporate social responsibility uh, programs where they actually put urban uh, farms on their rooftops, which both will cool down the building, save electricity, and secondly, will be producing fresh herbs for the employees and or for, for elderlies, which some of them do. So this is our own Richwood urban farm today. And uh, yeah, this is, this is really our journey. I'm very happy that we are here today. And uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thorben. Um, just a question. Uh, do you think, uh, when you embarked on this, did you, did you feel that there was a market for this product? I felt there was a market, you yes. Felt there it, was was a, it was a feeling because I think every, everyone, I'm sure everyone in this room can identify with the, with the idea that it's good. And, and I, I remember thinking that all my friends, all of them, when you go to their outdoor space, they all have pots. No plants, they have pots with soil. <laughs> so they all tried, right? So I thought, hey, let's make it easier. And I think that if that's the, that's the hurdle that we wanted to overcome, the barrier of entry, right. because everyone says, my plants die. I can't do it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So um, what's really interesting is we've had four speakers who come from different places with, uh, in some ways, a similar point of view about how we should embrace nature and how we're so distant from it. So please go out and talk to all four of them, figure out where the philosophies are, and, and they all have different farming concepts.